Um, hi, I'm Nadia. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, this conference has a special place in my heart because it marks a little over a year ago that I started diving into the world of open source and funding. And I know this because um, Russell, who was president of the Django Software Foundation at the time, was one of the first people I ever talked to about any of this stuff. And he mentioned this conference. And I was like, oh, cool. It's in Amsterdam. Sounds really awesome. Um, maybe I'll attend next year. And was secretly thinking, I have no clue what I'm going to be doing next year. Um, so it's really awesome that I actually made it here and that you've invited me here. So um, I was asked to talk about open source and funding. Um, normally, when I talk about this stuff, it's more around documenting the problem and the need, um, which is mostly what I did in that report. But a year into this journey, I get kind of bored about talking about the same things. So I thought we would spend this time talking about solutions. So that's what I wanted to write about um, when I was writing this talk. And uh, when I sat down to write it, I realized this is actually a really hard talk to do um, because it required documenting all these very vague feelings that I had about this space. And uh, specifically that I think when we talk about open source and funding, it tends to be around a specific project like Django. Um, and this makes sense if you have a particular affinity to a project. But for me, um, coming in as an outsider to open source, I've been trying to think about how we do this for not just one project, but like 100 projects or 1,000 projects, and how do we do it all at the same time. Um, and so this requires thinking about it in more of like a system building kind of way, um, which is a lot more challenging, because you have to do all these things up front that don't seem to really obviously relate to money. Um, and all that stuff is actually the hard part. And if you get all of that in place, then the money part is actually quite easy, um, which is why I titled this talk, um, Funding Open Source the Hard Way. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, before I get to all that, just starting with sort of like the problem, um, I think no matter how you feel about open source and funding, everyone can agree that you don't do it for the money. Um, nobody really got rich making off their open source project. Um, <clears throat> Case in point, um, Django's projected revenue for this year is somewhere around 200,000. Um, Instagram's projected revenue is somewhere around 3.2 billion. Um, and this is actually not a real chart, obviously, because um, Instagram's revenue is 16,000 times that of Django's, um, and I couldn't even put it on this slide. <laughs> and so if you look at that, you're sort of like, all right, um, clearly, if, if, if I were a venture capitalist, for example, and I looked at this, I would kind of look at the project on the left, and I would go, hmm, I don't, I don't know how that project's doing. Um, I don't know if I want to look at that one. But the joke would be on me, right? Um, because Django is um, one of many open source projects that power Instagram, and they don't just power Instagram, they power a lot of other really big, really profitable companies. Um, so my takeaway from looking at this is you can't use revenue to um, talk about open source's success. And so we find ourselves in this dilemma because on the one hand you can say open source is an incredible force for quality and community precisely because it hasn't been defined in market terms. Um, because if we were going to use market terms like revenue, um, most open source projects would never have stood a chance. And that's really cool on one side. Um, but we have to balance that with the other side um, where we say as an industry it's frightening how much of the infrastructure that we rely on is maintained by complete volunteers. And so we have to find somewhere in between where we're saying um, this isn't about trying to turn open source into a billion dollar business or even say that it should be a business at all. Um, but on the other hand, zero dollars in the system is also a bad thing. Um, and at this point you might be saying, well, you know, I know that there is some funding in the system. I know some people make money um, doing open source work. What's wrong with the options right now? To which I would say, um, I, I think the problem is actually in how we're defining the problem. Um, it's not about whether there's money in the system, but it's about whether there's access to money. And so what I mean by that, this got cut off. Um, if you look at some of these examples here, um, if you are looking to buy a home, you go to a bank. Um, if you're looking to start a business, you can go uh, get venture capital. Um, if you're a university, you have an endowment. Open source doesn't have that equivalent. Um, right now, it's all just like very ad hoc. Um, so when we talk about open source and funding, it's stuff like crowdfunding um, or bounties or tipping. And these things are not really sustainable. They're about finding cash on hand in the moment. But if you're for you know, the next couple of projects, like 
where do they go to find that money? So uh, the problem that I'm trying to solve, at least, is trying to figure out how open source can have access to institutional capital, not just these one-off crowdfunding campaigns. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, what could we do with all that money if we did have access to institutional capital um, the same way that other sectors do? Um, there's two sides of it for me. One is about being able to take more risks, um, and the other side is more about maintenance. And so on the risk-taking side, um, right now, to be able to participate significantly in open source um, and, and make ongoing contributions, you need to have a high level of risk tolerance. Um, that means that people who have debts or um, families, caretaking obligations, um, a lot of people simply don't have the time to do this when it's completely volunteered. And that means a lot of really good ideas might go unheard of. Um, so venture capital would be the example of a sector where um, having that type of capital means that startup founders, um, people with ideas, can take really big risks. And the equivalent is not true right now in open source. Um, a lot of these situations just require people to get lucky. So as an example of that, um, Ryan Dahl is the author of Node.js and has a pretty interesting origin story um, where he sort of just like had this idea for like where the world was going um, and he decided to quit his job and work on the first iteration of Node.js um, for six months, unpaid. And after he got to this point, he decided to present the idea at JSConf in Europe. And afterwards, it was sort of just like opening up to bids. Um, and a lot of companies came up to him afterwards, and they were really excited about the idea, and they were you know, trying to convince him to come over to their company. Um, but when he kind of dug into the details, a lot of them were saying, you know, I want to do this, can you do this as 20% time? Um, or hopefully we can build it into our product somehow and we can sell it. And he said that that just didn't feel right because it's an open source project and that kind of wasn't the point. And Joyent was the only company that reached out to Ryan Dahl and said, hey, you know, we don't really know where this is going, we don't really know how this ties into our business, um, but just come here, work on it full time and we'll figure something out. And it was because Joyent gave him that opportunity that we have Node right now. Um, but like inherent in that story is that there are all these risks that he had to take. Uh, he you know, was working unpaid on the idea for six months. A lot of people can't afford to do something like that. A lot of people are not just going to get lucky where he found one company that was willing to take a chance on him. And we're probably missing out on a lot of other really great ideas like Node that we just don't even know about. And if you look at other open source projects, um, surprise, surprise, a lot of them are started by employees, including Django. Um, and that's not an accident. It's because when you're an employee at a company, um, you can build out some sort of like different or risky idea, and if you fail, it's okay, you still have your day job. So that's the risk side of it. Um, the other side of it is being able to invest back into existing projects. And this is another defining characteristic and problem of open source right now, um, where you have a lot of fragmentation, um, people constantly starting new projects instead of investing back into old ones. Um, existing projects where they could use more money to make it better and keep up with the times, but that money is not available to them. Um, even this, this weekend, um, I've been hearing people saying Django is boring, and not being sure whether Django being boring is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and there's sort of like that fear about being boring because you don't know whether that means everyone's going to go use something else, um, because that's the way things kind of work right now. And so being able to have access to money um, is actually really important for maintenance purposes. And so the corollary being with, um, in government, in the US, um, nearly half of the state budget goes towards um, maintenance of roads and not construction. And this is actually a third of what's needed to properly maintain roads, so it's not even enough. Um, but the point being that, you know, if you did build a road, you didn't have to worry about, will I have access to money to be able to maintain this in the future? Um, or do we have to tear out the whole road and build a new one <laughs> because that's all we have money for? So that part is really important. Um, as an example of how this has worked really well, um, one of my favorite examples is actually the Django Fellowship, um, where someone is being paid um, full-time to do all the unglamorous maintenance tasks, things like maintaining a roadmap, um, or closing old issues, or reviewing other people's code, um, stuff that you can't just expect a casual contributor to do in their spare time. Um, and it had a really measurable effect on Django's releases coming out on schedule. So if all this sounds good to you, um, now we get to the hard part, which is how do we actually get money into the open source ecosystem? Um, and 
for, this is sort of like how I think about the open source ecosystem. Um, at the top, you have people who are producing software. Um, they, put it, they put out an open source project. Then you have um, users who could be individuals or companies that are using the project. And because open source is zero cost, um, they're able to have these outsized social and financial outcomes. Um, and theoretically, those extra resources should be in part going back to the producers. So we're really talking about um, the resources part of this. And I kind of want to point out this isn't without um, historical precedent of this being a cycle that works. Um, if you think about modern nonprofits, um, at least in the US, I don't know how it works outside of the US, but in the US, um, modern nonprofits as we know it have only been around for about 100 years. And they came about um, as a direct result of the Industrial Revolution. So you had all these people who became really wealthy um, because they had managed to optimize the production. And all these, you had all these wealthy people, and then um, the public started criticizing them and saying, hey, you made a ton of money off of the backs of average citizens. Um, why don't you put some of that back into the rest of society? And it was because of that pressure um, that you had Andrew Carnegie and these other like, really prominent philanthropists saying, hey, they're right. We should be putting money back into the system. Um, and that's why we have a nonprofit sector today. Before that, it just didn't really exist. Um, and so what all that says to me is that the money is already out there. So that part has actually been solved. Um, and that's a good thing. The resources are out there. It's figuring out where to direct it. That's hard. Um, and that's not just about building a business case um, or making the right pitch to a company, but it's actually like, how do you distribute those funds back into an entire system? Um, it's actually really hard. <laughs> and so the best, worst question that I get um, in my job right now um, is a company saying, I have a bunch of money, which project should I give it to? And at first it sounds like the best question in the world because it's all I ever really wanted. Um, but if you, I mean, if you actually think about, like, personally, how do you answer that question, um, you might see where the problem is. Because, at least for me, I started answering this question by saying, oh yeah, I know a ton of projects that you should, you should give money to. Um, then I started thinking, well, you know, why should this company care about those projects? How do I know those are the most important projects to give to? And so without having clear metrics, without having clear vocabulary to talk about funding needs, um, this is actually a really tough question to answer without being super subjective and super biased. <clears throat> so in order to like, get to that point where we can say, Here is where you, here's where you should be spending your money, um, we have to figure out a bunch of things. And so this is my personal to-do list on um, how to properly fund open source. Um, requires thinking about who actually needs the money. So this is about metrics and analytics. Um, figuring out, like, of the projects that need money, what do they actually need money for? Um, how do we actually fund them when you've connected a funder in a project? How does that money get dispersed? And then finally, who's in charge of funding them? Um, who's responsible for this? And I think when we talk about funding open source, we tend to focus on the fourth one, which is let's just figure out like, who has the most money and then ask them for money. Um, but really, it's steps one through three that are really important um, because it's actually pretty hard for a funder to figure out how to give project's money. Um, so I'm going to just kind of go through these. Um, the question about who needs money is a metrics question. Um, almost every company that has said, I have a bunch of money, who do I give, which projects do I give it to? Um, their next question is, have you come up with some sort of like, ranking or listing for projects that I can look at so I can figure out which projects are really in need? Um, and every time I have to say, no, that doesn't exist, unfortunately. Um, there is no methodology for ranking projects in need. And in fact, we don't even really have metrics for, like, for projects usage at all. Um, and that's really unfortunate <clears throat> because a project needs, if, you, if they want to raise money or build a business case for themselves, um, they have to have hard numbers. An example of how this has not worked really well um, is the Yorba Foundation um, when they applied for tax exempt status um, from the IRS. And the Yorba Foundation was this foundation that was formed around, um, to support an open source project. And they applied to the IRS to be a nonprofit. And the IRS said no. And they said no for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the reasons why they said no was they said, you know, companies could be using your open source project. People could be using your open source project. How do we really know that you're in the public benefit and this isn't just a commercial thing? And the Yorba Foundation replied to that by saying, 
uh, well, we're, we're like a tree, where a tree could shade um, a cafe or it could shade your average passerby. Open source kind of covers everything. And while that's a really nice metaphor, um, it doesn't really help build a, a concrete case. It would have been so much better if they could have said, you know, we reach 20 million people and these 20 nonprofits, and therefore um, we're serving the public benefit. So numbers are really important. Um, there are two types of metrics that I'm interested in. Um, one is around the actual ecosystem. So how do projects all relate to each other? Who's using what? Um, I think that Libraries.io is probably doing the best job of measuring this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's all around dependencies. And uh, an example of like, how this has worked in a project's favor um, is Heartbleed, which was this security bug that was found in OpenSSL. Um, and it was, one, I think, the most widely publicized security bug ever in mainstream media. And if you remember the headlines from, um, from Heartbleed, they would say things like, uh, two-thirds of the internet are in danger uh, from this like, security risk, or two-thirds of the internet is being supported by two guys named Steve. It was like really great headlines, um, and the media loved it. Um, but the reason that OpenSSL was able to calculate that two-thirds of the internet depended on them was because they said they knew that Apache used them and they knew that Nginx used them, and they knew that those two things together equal two-thirds of market share. Therefore, two-thirds of the internet depends on OpenSSL. That's how it was calculated. Um, but it was because they knew what the dependencies were that they were able to make that case. And it actually worked out really well for them in terms of getting funding. Um, the other side is project level metrics. So within each individual project, how do you know how many people are using you? Um, what does contribution activity look like? When we talk about healthy projects, what does that actually mean? And how do you track that in an objective way? Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but these are just some examples of metrics that like, I think are really important to projects. So if you're in the earliest stages of starting an open source project, you're probably interested in, like, are people using my project at all? And if they are, where are they coming from? As you hit the, the growth phase, you might be thinking about, well, now I'm starting to get some outside contributors. I want to make sure that that, that continues. Um, so I want to track who's contributing to my project and how many of them are. Um, and when you hit the mature stage, you probably are interested in both of these things. So you're looking at, um, is user growth continuing? Because if it flattens, that's a problem. And are there still like first-time contributors coming to my project? Because if not, then it risks getting stale. Um, and as maintainers, are we responding to, to new contributors? Are we responding to new issues being opened? Um, are we doing a good job of like managing the community? Um, the punchline for all this is that Unfortunately, it's really hard for projects to track this information right now, and it's not projects' fault. Um, it's because like, platforms like GitHub um, or your package manager or whatever um, don't do a great job of sharing these metrics back out or making it easy for projects to implement their own tracking. Um, that's something that I'm personally interested in working on um, in my role right now. Uh, second part is um, what do they actually need money for? So if you imagine, you figured out which projects are in need, um, what do they actually need funding for? And this might be really obvious for people within open source, um, but it's not obvious to people outside of it. So it's just important to be able to convey that. Um, again, returning to just the idea of different project stages, you can see that like, at different stages, um, you need money for completely different things. So in the earliest stages, it might be something like, I just need dedicated time to write code. Um, this is like the Ryan Dahl and, and Joyant kind of story. It's totally fine to fund one person, spend all their time kind of proving out a concept. Um, but as you kind of go towards like a more mature stage, you're probably looking for things like, I want to fund major new features or really boring maintenance tasks. Um, as far as I understand, that's why this conference exists and that's why like, conferences like PyCon exist. Um, it's to help pay for like, core contributors to get together and work on these things. Um, you're probably looking at things like community management, um, reviewing other people's code. You might hire people to do fundraising full-time. Um, but depending on what type of project you are and where you're at, you have very different things that you need. And so this is um, something that works really well in startups right now, where you have like seed stage funding, which is completely different from Series D funding. Um, and 
not only are you funding different things at those stages, but they're actually completely different funders. So you have venture firms that are focused on like seed stage funding, and venture firms that are focused on like growth stage funding, and they're completely different because their needs are different. The third thing is thinking about um, if you have a funder and you have a project, how does that money actually get dispersed to the project? And so the question here is, should funders give to people or should they give to the projects? Um, this is a hard question. Uh, there are pros and cons for both sides. Um, if you're funding a project, you might be, it might be a lot more transparent um, that you're funding a project versus an individual. Um, that money will live on if someone leaves the project. But on the other hand, it's like a ton of extra legal paperwork. Um, if you're funding individuals, I think it actually can work really well because it respects the idea that um, like someone can come and contribute for a while and then they can leave and that's okay for a project. Um, but it also leads to people who can market themselves really well getting the most funding. Um, it leads to these risky situations where if someone loses their funding individually, then the project is at risk. Um, it's really important to figure this out though because for other sectors, um, it's, these kinds of things are already like really clearly defined in legal terms. So for like startups, no startup uh, will be anything besides a Delaware C Corp if they want to get vendor funding. That's just like a known thing. If you're a nonprofit, you have to be a 51C3 in the US. Um, otherwise, your funder doesn't get a tax write-off. And so these things are actually like legally defined of like, here is how you give money to a specific project. Um, open source doesn't have that at all. Uh, I don't think that it needs to have the, like some sort of magical new legal entity that's created for open source. Um, but we have to get really clear on when do you want to fund an individual, when do you want to fund a project, and what's required legally to get that in place. And so if we go down the, the project route, um, right now I think it's really important to focus on centralizing those efforts as much as possible. So not starting a whole new foundation every time you have a project that needs money, but trying to kind of join up with similar projects. So um, you can say like, you know, at the ecosystem level, you have like Ruby Together, JavaScript Foundation, are examples of foundations that do this for their specific ecosystem. Um, you can get even more generalized and say, uh, Software Freedom Conservancy or Open Collective um, are examples of fiscal sponsors where like the projects are not really related to each other, but they can apply to um, have this foundation sponsor them so they can accept donations. And they can go like super centralized, um, like the Linux Foundation, which not only serves as a fiscal sponsor for all these different projects, but also provides services like um, accounting and marketing and fundraising. And I think right now um, that makes sense because there isn't a whole lot of money in the room yet. Um, so the problem is from like a company side, they don't want to fund like 20 different projects that are sort of related to each other. They kind of just want to give it to one place. And so it makes sense to centralize your efforts as much as possible. I think somewhere later down the line, it kind of make, you, you can imagine they're having like a lot of different um, organizations, but right now it's just like we're not really in that position. Um, this is the area that I'm more interested in for the time being, is building up opportunities for individual grants. Um, none of these existed five years ago, the options I've put up here. Um, three of them didn't exist two years ago. Uh, so like this area is actually like changing pretty quickly. Um, of organizations that are offering funding for people to work on projects as individuals. Um, I think it just kind of makes sense right now because there's a lot less paperwork involved. You can fund contractors. Um, the other reason why I think funding individuals right now makes sense is because we still can't answer this question of how do projects become financially sustainable. And this isn't like, uh, say, the nonprofit sector where you can just, there's so much money out there, you can just like continue to find a foundation to give you money forever. Um, we don't really have that luxury right now, so we have to figure out like, how does a project actually live on in the long term? And if we don't really know that, um, funding individuals right now kind of makes sense because it can be sort of like this closed project that can be finished and then you move on to the next type of grant. Um, this is a really hard question. And this is actually a question that um, even outside of open source, like internet related philanthropy in general, they're really struggling to answer this question because by, almost by definition, if you're, if you're an internet business, you can make money. If you're something internet related that's not a business, then 
there isn't really a path to revenue, so what happens after the grant expires or runs out? So the last question is the magical one of who are all these mysterious funders that should be giving us money? Um, to which I would ask, who cares the most about protecting the open source commons? Um, and I specifically say commons here because you have corporate open source, um, which effectively has its own sponsor. Um, something like Go, for example, originated from Google, is probably not going anywhere. They basically have a patron already. Um, but who cares about like community-built open source, like Django, for example? Um, companies are probably the most obvious answer here. Um, smaller companies or I guess like really any type of company needs to know that um, these like zero cost free resources exist if they want to start a new company. So it's really important to protect that commons. Um, bigger companies worry about um, their competitors having some sort of um, advantage over them if they release uh, software, if they release their own version of open source software. Um, downside is that every one company is unfortunately beholden to their own business goals. So uh, figuring out the company side of things requires getting companies to work together, which is a lot harder. Um, but I think there's probably a situation where companies can be really good for some things, an individual company can be good for some things, um, and companies working together as a group are good for other things. Um, just to kind of think through a couple other possible funders, um, government is sort of like where we tend to turn to to protect the public good. Um, so government takes care of things like transportation or education or healthcare, depending uh, what your government is. So um, some of that is good. Um, the downside is that government has not traditionally really been a leader in technology. Um, they tend to be sort of lagging, and so they might not really be that compatible with the rapid iteration that comes with open source software. Um, the other big problem with government is that uh, a lot of projects are not confined to one, uh, one country or one government. And so you have the question of, like, does the US government fund uh, a contributor in Australia? Does that make sense? Um, the other issue is around like security. So I've heard about projects where uh, government has said, we will give you funding if you put in this convenient backdoor, or if you give us privileged um, access to security disclosures. And so like all of that poses a lot of ethical questions. Um, academia, similarly, I think is really great at thinking about like, you know, think about the long term. They have these endowments. Um, they're not stressed about finding a business model or commercializing opportunities. But again, because they go at this really slow pace, um, they might not be super compatible with open source. Um, I'm actually not super concerned about this last question <laughs> because I think finding the right funder is like the last part of it. Um, I think there could be some sort of combination where you have like government or academia funding maintenance and companies funding innovation or we figure out how to get companies to work together. But I think without having all that earlier stuff in place, this part doesn't really matter yet. Um, I like to, in my head, I sort of compare it to an open source project where if you have, you imagine a contributor coming to your project, and if you haven't documented to them how they should be contributing, what they should be doing, um, why they should be there, that person's probably gonna leave and you'll never have even heard of them. And so it's a similar sort of thing right now where if we don't have this stuff like clearly documented to a funder of, why they should be doing it and how they should be doing it, they're kind of just going to leave right now. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what's happening. Um, that being said, I do think we're at the beginning of something pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap up with a blast, blast through this uh, history lesson here. Um, but if you kind of think through all the different phases of open source um, since it started in, let's say, the 70s or 80s, um, each phase is sort of like marked a different point in time. So in the beginning, it was about trying to get producers to contribute to open source projects in the first place and saying this is a valuable use of your time. Um, and then we got to saying, all right, we have these interesting open source projects. How do we convince users that um, this is safe or secure or reliable enough to put into a commercial application? Um, and then after that, it was saying, is there any real advantage to using open source versus closed source software? Um, the answer was yes, and not necessarily for the reason that a lot of people thought, um, but it was because it was zero cost. And if open source costs nothing to use, then starting a company is really, really cheap, and now you have these really outsized financial outcomes, so now there's all this money floating around. Um, and so we're really just in that, 
last phase, which is saying, we got all the money, like we've proven out that open source is super useful to people and they want to use it and it's financially beneficial um, and people want to contribute to it. So everything else has been figured out. We just kind of got to get the last part in. Um, I think this is actually a totally solvable problem. Um, history supports it from all these other sectors. It's just a matter of figuring out how to get that whole machine working before we start putting financial resources into it. That's all I got. Okay, so we have a bunch of questions. Um, the internet has been a little on the wobbly side, so apologies if anyone's been trying to ask a question and hasn't yet. Um, so you said there were a bunch of people who'd come and said to you that, hi, I've got some money, who do I fund? Uh, what sort of scale are we talking about there? Are you talking about people with a few thousand dollars? <laughs> millions of dollars? Billions of dollars? Why do you what are we missing know? out on? Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually been funny. Like, there, there's been a very wide range of things. There's been individual people. There's also been very, very large companies. Um, and you can hear the opportunity shrinking, which is like the most painful thing for me to hear. Of They start with this really big idea of like, oh yeah, we want to like fund open source. That's a great idea. And then they ask the question about like, well, do you have a ranking of projects? And it's like, well, no. And then they're like, so what do they want money for? And you're like, well, a bunch of things. And then they're like, is anyone else doing this? And it's like, no. And then you kind of hear it shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And then it's like something very small, um, which is unfortunate, which is why I feel really strongly about like, we got to figure out, be able to answer all those questions. Um, and it's actually quite impossible right now. So you know, to solve one of those problems, you were saying a lot about like usage metrics and being able to justify how we do things. Um, like we with Django have struggled for that for ages. It's like Andrew was saying earlier, he'd love to know that channels works at scale and he has no idea who's using channels in production. Um, Brew yeah. tried to solve this to some extent at some point by adding analytics in and they got a huge amount of backlash from the community yep. at the time. <laughs> have you got any ideas about how we can do that? You know, do we just suck it up and get people to register or yeah. how can we do it? Um, Homebrew actually did this pretty successfully as far as I can tell. This happened maybe six months ago. Um, they decided to start using Google Analytics and they got the backlash as expected. Um, but they made it so that anyone can opt out if they want to. They made it really clear that they're not tracking any sort of like individual level data. It's just this stuff in aggregate. Um, I think it's one of those things where you have to say, all right, people might be unhappy for a little bit, but they'll get over it. Just like a lot of new product features that people like to complain about. Um, but I do think it's really, really important to have. Um, I think that whole discussion on Homebrew is like documented on GitHub um, if you ever want to check it out. But yeah, I think part of it is just like being really firm while also being clear that there is like a commitment to respecting privacy. And obviously that will work well for, hey, I'm a, I'm a Django-sized project. I've got this huge user base that I know must exist somewhere. I just need to know how big it is. What sort of metrics can you use if you're a startup project, if you're a smaller thing that yeah. you know, you're trying to bootstrap yourself? That part is a lot harder. I think that's honestly on GitHub, for example, or package managers um, and or, let's say, uh, to be able to provide that information back. Right now, it's just really hard to get. I would say in the short term, um, being able to at least document stories of people who use your project, um, especially if they're companies, <laughs> is really useful. So even putting a call out and saying, like, hey, if you use this and you have a testimonial you want to add, just like, let us know. Um, at least anecdotes can help build a story around usage. So sticking with those sort of startup level projects, you know, what, have you met funders who are specifically interested in working with those kind of projects? And um, what is motivating them to throw money into a mystery black hole? <laughs> um, I don't think that the funders that I've talked to at least have not been, I think they don't know what they want yet. They know that the idea sounds shiny and cool to support open source. And I think that's really an awesome start to say, at least recognizing that this is an important space. Um, I think they're still looking for a lot of direction of like, how do I know which projects are important? Can I go to sleep at night knowing that I put my money towards the most important thing? And I think that's where things get a little bit um, squirmy. So, yeah. I mean, it's quite easy to put your money into a startup business that doesn't work as well. So right. <laughs> some people just like the risk, I guess. It's true. <laughs> um, do you think there's a place for some sort of open source funding platform or some company to step in and create such a platform that would take money from patrons, distribute it according to, you know, some sort of metrics and what the company's interested in? Um, 
on maybe to help bootstrap new projects through this communal fund? Yeah, um, the closest thing to that that exists right now is Open Collective. I would highly recommend that if anyone's interested. Um, so they make it really easy to set up, be able to take money without having to go through all the legal paperwork. Um, so they have like a, a ton of open source projects on their platform. Um, and then they also have a general fund that people can donate to, and then they distribute that money to other projects. Um, it's still new and growing, but they seem to be doing something really well. What are the risks of the more institutional money, um, aside from the small number of donors and if those donors dry up? Um, is there still kind of a strong tendency that you know, lots of donors and lots of smaller donors, lots of medium-sized companies and smaller companies is a good idea? Um, mm. Or should we be focusing effort more on hitting the big boys with a big amount of money? Is this for like a specific project foundation or? Just in general. In really? general. Um, I think on the foundation level, think about diversifying, it makes sense. Um, so Ruby Together, for example, has actually limited the amount of money that any one company can give because they don't want to be in the situation where one giant company pulls out and then suddenly they have no money left. Um, so they've been thinking a lot about risk diversification. Um, they're, I think it kind of also just depends, again, on the stage of project. So if you know you're going to have money to work on something for a year and like, and that's all, that's all you really need, um, that's different from getting hired by a company to work on an idea into perpetuity and you don't know when that's going to end, um, then that's almost certainly guaranteed to be a situation that's not going to end well. Um, there's a few questions around sort of, for want of a better word, forcing the issue. So, um, you know, we need funding. Should the licensing reflect that you need to push funding back in? Should, you know, should we have like more GPL style licensing or that kind of thing that creates an obligation on users to start doing this, basically going down the sort of like brute, yeah. legal brute force <laughs> route? Do you think that's a good idea or should we be sticking more to the philanthropic yeah. direction? Um, I think all experiments are good right now, so I don't want to discourage anyone else's ideas. If you're asking for my personal opinion, um, I mean, GPL and Copyleft has been trying to do this, and the enforcement side has actually been really legally murky and not clear of, like, can you enforce when someone is using GPL in a way that it wasn't meant to be used? Um, so I don't really know that this is a license question. I think it's really much more of a cultural question. And I think I'm biased in that direction just because I think people are interesting. Um, but like, I think this is more of like people even having an awareness that something is an issue and then being motivated to change it. Um, works better than kind of like the stick of enforcement. <laughs> so if we're trying to build that sort of culture where we've got the, the Instagram scale companies or the Facebook style scale companies or whatever, pushing money back into open source that they're using, how can we go about trying to create that culture? I think... That kind of a talk? Yeah, that's kind of the point. Um, I mean, being able to like share stories out, I think is just like really important. Um, human, I think it was just sort of like humanizing what's going on behind the scenes of open source projects. Um, a lot of people just see it as... You know, they land on a project, they grab the code and they leave, and they don't always know what else is happening. Or if they have a problem, that's the first time they'll start digging around and saying, oh, where can I like, open an issue and complain about something? They just don't have the same context. Um, that's something that has just really struck me from the beginning of like, you can have people who are software developers or people who work in software all day long who just have no idea what's going on inside open source. Um, so I think like, a big part of it right now is just around like, being able to like, build those bridges as much as possible, share stories out, like, have it like front and center on your like projects page of like here is my face or whatever and like you know this is like I work on this project um, and just trying to like bring the human side to it as much as possible. Um, when you've been talking to people who are wanting to run these projects um, or wanting to fund projects, has it always been that people are looking to do the stuff that's most relevant to them? Is it very much so like I use this project, therefore I want to fund that project? or yeah. I want to build this thing that uses this, therefore I'll fund that? Um, or is there actually quite a lot of just like general ecosystem support that goes on? Yeah, I think uh, when it starts, it tends to be the general ecosystem idea of, you know, I want to have this sort of goodwill in the community and I want to support open source. Um, and then when you get down to, well, then you should do this, then it's like, well, actually, I really want to support the projects that I use, um, which again, kind of makes sense if you're a company, I can't fault them for that either. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it ends up being very self-interested and that's kind of like where the problem lies. 
Cool. Um, so apologies to anyone who's been trying to ask questions with the dodgy internet. Nadia will continue the conversation yes. in the Slack channel. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Harry.